Bet you thought I knew what I was going to do when we started this show, didn't you? I mean, you always have something like ready to jump in. Or John usually also has a funny story to, you know, or a question to ask. So so how was the sausage festival that you were attending there, my friend? Uh, almost as good as you trying to get that sentence out. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> sausage is such a Sean meaty Connery. word to wrap your tongue around. You know, mm. it's difficult to nail the dismount. It was Tasty. good, but honestly, you know, I just missed uh, psychedelic poops. That's really what I Well, did. I mean, if you ate enough sprinkles, you could have psychedelic poops anytime you wanted. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm just one man. One unicorn. One mission. Well, Courtney, you just got back from a trip, too. Yes, and I'm sunburned and tired and sad that we're not at the beach anymore. <laughs> oh. San Diego? And yes. Sanita? Uh We stayed in Chula Vista, which oh. was a little bit further south. So we we're about 10 miles from the border, and it was very tempting to go down yeah. and get some really good Mexican food. Ooh. And you live to tell about it. Yeah. <laughs> Denivelle News made Usually a movie do. about it. <laughs> well, you know, certain individuals of the Republican regime would tell you that there's nothing but thieves and charlatans that live within the border region, and uh, they can't be trusted. Also, I'm the fucking president. I'll take Indeed. the steering wheel if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> no way You're this thing's made a catch up. <laughs> no way this thing's flying out the fucking window when I'm driving. No way. <sighs> <laughs> Picture he has like a kid steering wheel in the back. He's like, it's not working. I can't turn around. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like literally in the like back of the headrest so that he can forget that he's driving. <laughs> Look, mom. So, he looks like Danny Torrance on a big wheel anytime he's moving from place to place. <laughs> I live inside the White House. <laughs> he does have a little boy that lives in his mouth, though. I'm fairly certain. <laughs> At one point or another, I'm sure that's not incorrect. The only difficulty is is that the uh, the tot signed an NDA, so we're probably not going to hear about it until like 2027 when it's beyond the point of relevancy. Speaking mm-hmm. of, did you guys notice that that whole uh, Nirvana Nevermind cover or album cover lawsuit just disappeared like unceremoniously? Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Right. Curious. When the mm-hmm. kid that was on the cover was suing for you know damages because it, his naked little tiny boy dick was published <laughs> all over the world. I yeah, that was like 30 drowned. years ago, right? Yeah, so then like a lot, like, <laughs> like he put the case. lawsuit out like a few years ago. No, 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 then... it felt like it was 30 years ago, considering all the yeah. shit that's happened. He oh, sued man. them in utero. <laughs> <laughs> that is a quality joke. Well, they joke. are people. They can do that now. And oh, the longer start. we go, he's just going to kill the joke, Shane. <laughs> don't so you might start, as well just... buddy. I will come through this screen. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I will turn this podcast around. Oh, no. Well, let's Unlike keep the, uh... Shane, she hopes something bad happens to you. <laughs> Indeed. Well, let's keep the uh, Nirvana puns coming and uh, say, <laughs> me, daddy. Oh, God. Oh. Teenage spirit? <laughs> oh. I feel like you have to censor both of those smells yeah. like? teenage spirit no teenage spirit i think we need to keep in in full effect oh and it's man. not my f- i didn't write the song you didn't he write did. the song i will say that like when i was a teenager and i was listening to in utero i wouldn't like that song i was like oh fuck yeah i was like that's such a great song it's like a real fuck you like you know men are the worst anti anti establishment kind of shit Mm -hmm. But now it's like the song on the record where I skip every time because it's just too much. It's very aggro. Uh, You know, the fact that it's in close proximity to another song called Heart Shaped Box is just very confusing. It is very confusing. The track listing of In Utero is is mind boggling. Indeed. If you are sitting and drinking Penny Royalty. I prefer to milk it. Indeed. And uh, speaking of royalties, is something we will never see. And uh, it's a foreign (laughs) concept. But by the eternal... Behold. 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 It's the Disinformed Podcast. I'm Shane. I'm John. I'm Michael. I'm Courtney. And we're operating here royalty-free forever because we don't know how to make money or sense. Oof. Neither money, marbles, or chalk, as my father used to say. <laughs> but yeah, uh, for that. You eat chalk? Like yeah. chalk salad? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's good for it's the, the digestion. Yeah. Chalk suey? That was a bad pun. I'm sorry. That was All a right. bad system of yeah. pun. Ooh. Coming in hot. Case of this right now. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll allow it. Oh, my God. What God is happening? Damn. 
<laughs> Hashtag cancel me today, apparently. Woo! All right. But for There's the, a dust uh, yeah. storm and Shane's head is literally caving in on him. So yep. it's probably just yep. going to get weirder from here. <laughs> yeah. I feel like my eyes are actively trying to turn inside to see what's happening. But uh, for the uninitiated amongst you who have not uh, been dissuaded by the number of bleeps that were preceding <laughs> my statement here for this episode, what we typically do is we dive into a random esoteric topic, and in the course of explaining it to one another, we lie occasionally. That is the shtick. The difference is, is that the co-hosts have to try to ferret out the fact from fiction as we listen and yell at the lies, scream posse at them whenever they try to identify mm. them. But uh, we do not allow you, the listener, to leave disinformed. However, oh no, no, we have a little denouement at the end of the show. We explain what we lied about and why. And so... This week, we're going to have something which has been building in the loins of one of our co-hosts for quite some times, and due to his shorts, is now finally being released all over our face, neck, and chest. Michael, what are you going to torment us with today? So, I'm going to start, there are eight lies today. Well, look at you stealing a page out of my playbook. Yeah, I decided to go ham uh, with all the lies today. So... After the brilliantly written live episode on the Comics Code Authority, I realized that there has been a reoccurring Bullshit. Theme. Damn, you got the first line. No, it's, yeah, it's true. No, it's that true. was a steaming pile of cow dung, <laughs> Ouch. which gave birth to a mushroom. Well, when John was slipping on all, on all of that mayo, call back, um, it, was, it was hard for you to keep track and attention, so it's fair. It's fair. Mm, yes. Um, so after... That episode, I realize there has been a reoccurring theme that we've been intentionally or accidentally doing for the majority of our time as a podcast. Censoring me. <laughs> Putting you in jail. Yeah. yeah. Someone's yeah. got to. I guess there are several reoccurring themes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the theme that I'm talking about today is panic, specifically mass panic. Uh, from the satanic panic to Ozzy's suicide solution, the first war on weed to Slenderman, the fear of the masses has been a tintillating topic for us to touch upon. Wow, the alliterative nail that you just <laughs> rolled off there. I know, I'm feeling uh, sassy today. Good lord. Woo. It's a whole new Michael. Yeah. I'm going to have to ask you to put your pants back on. <laughs> Shane, uh, can, Shane can be without pants, but more than one, I'm starting to get a little concerned. Hand check. It's, well, just, it's more comfy. Oh, I'm holding a fidget. Give me, a, give me a minute. <laughs> I'm fidgeting. Sorry, I'm fidgeting, but I'm I'm not playing with anything else. Um, speaking of the satanic panic of the '80s, I think it's time we revisit that time period and learn about a panic that some see as a continuation of the satanic panic, the Dungeons and Dragons panic. Now, I was 40 years old in the 1980s, and I can tell you for a certainty. That, uh, yeah, there was a lot of panic going on. That young? Oh, wow. I My know. bad. I'm sorry. Well, I was 40 for the 18th time. Oh, okay. That explains I it. I think it goes in cycles. really <laughs> bad was in the early aughts when the panic went to the disco. Well, as soon as it got to the disco, that's, <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. that's where the panic got pretty extreme. I mean, if you were epileptic, you were not having a good time. It was I a mean, bad time. It's not even arguable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Unless um, you were wearing your helmet out in public, you were just bound and determined to get concussed. They said I don't have to wear that anymore, so I've been enjoying my freedom from that. Oh, so that's how you got a kid. My skull, my choice. Uh, for those who don't remember and can't be bothered to re-listen to episode 72 of the Satanic Panic episode, let me briefly remind y'all how that panic started. Oh, God. It's, it's very quick, I promise. Um, there's three or four pages on it, but it's very quick. Okay, good. I'm prepared. <laughs> Let me get um, another drink. <laughs> uh, the satanic ritual abuse mass panic began with the publication of Michelle Remembers, a book which pub or which covered a series of remembered air quotes childhood abuses co-written by a Canadian psychiatrist and his psychiatric patient slash wife. In it, the wife, while hypnotized, recounts terrible abuses done to her by her allegedly satanic mother and other neighbors, which culminated in a adventure. I'm sorry, an Avengers-style team up where Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and the Archangel Michael team up to beat the shit out of Satan. Is Michelle is is that book real? Yeah, yeah, that oh, was that God. was a good chunk of um. It the was beginning called Michelle Remembers episode. as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No shit. You really talked about Phineas Gage? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus then removes the physical and mental scars from the psych- psychiatric, the psychiatrist's wife uh, to resurface when the time was right, just as the prophecy foretold. Ooh. The panic, the panic, panic, the panic <laughs> spread at the disco. The panic um, spread. <laughs> The Spranic Preg. I, I, hit, uh, the, I hit the, the Pranic button. The 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 Spranic Preg. The the Ranic Mreg. Uh, the the panic spread, <laughs> starting with Oprah's talk show after she endorsed the book, and gained national national nationwide attention through a series of trials that came about due to mandatory reporting laws, and social workers too inexperienced to avoid leading questions. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty much my synopsis of that episode okay i will tell you though going forward if you make a sandwich without using panic spread you're doing it wrong are we sponsored by panic no not this oh. week but it's just it's damn tasty and panic. low calorie yeah panic spread Ooh. Mm-hmm. awesome i thought you said fedex spread for a second and i was very confused <laughs> no panic spread oh panic spread yes special reduction half price closeout sale mm, bye 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 um, the D and D panic started much more reasonably than a book written by a psychiatrist and his patient slash wife. It started with a missing sixteen year old Michigan State University student named James Dallas Egbert the third in nineteen seventy nine. Wow, that is a very accomplished young man to be in college at the age of sixteen. We're gonna get into that. I don't um, doubt it. Now, I just mentioned a reasonable start to a moral panic. And now I got to throw in a trigger warning for pretty much the rest of the episode. We're a little too um, late for that, I'm afraid. <sighs> shower time with the brave little toaster is going to be brought up a lot for a bit. Um, or a lot. I don't know why I said for a bit. It's going to be brought up a lot as we set up these inciting incidents. Let me get my shower cap. You've been looking in my <laughs> dreams again? Anyway, now I've gotten that out of the way. Uh, James Dallas Egbert III was not a happy child. As a child prodigy, he was pushed by his parents into starting college at the ripe old age of 16. He was an absolute genius at computers. One article mentions him repairing computers for the U.S. Air Force when he was 12. Didn't he make the iPhone? (laughs) No, he doesn't make it that long to see the iPhone. (laughs) Jebna Um, ain't sticking around to see the Apple. No, no. (laughs) Mm -mm. Uh it kind of ties in with that apple bite. <laughs> uh, this plus him being incredibly young, and as James later revealed to someone he trusted, gay or at least bisexual in the 70s, kind of leads to a college experience that I think we'd all agree was not very cash money. Well, it depends on your definition, because maybe he did find some sweet, slippery fun. That's fair. He had one social outlet uh, where he was able to relax, and that was Dungeons & Dragons. And before you say anything... Yes, D&D is a social activity. Playing with several people is far more social than just playing with yourself. I disagree. (laughs) (laughs) It depends on how many people are watching at the time. Also, if you're wearing depends. I like that I can miss an episode, but listen back and hear Shane just tell the jokes that I would have said. It's always Mm -hmm. lovely. (laughs) The the rectum damn near killed her. It was it was great. Yeah, it was good stuff. What he's also admitting to is that both he and I have active chatterbait profiles that we're still trying to spam (laughs) people into paying us for, so. Uh, In all my research, the only mention of D&D in this story was that he was with a group of MSU students who played D&D, and these students would sometimes LARP in the steam tunnels under the university. Like you do. Before anyone in the comments corrects me, or reviews, etc., D&D and LARPing are two are two totally different things. D&D is pen and paper based, meaning it plays like a board game of sorts, whereas LARPing is done typically outside, usually usually by dressing up as your character and physically acting out what your character is doing, as opposed to simply explaining it in D&D. Or physically acting out yeah. like our former president. It's like D&D, like think the kids at the beginning of Stranger Things playing in the basement. Yeah. And then LARPing, if you've seen role models, that's LARPing. There you go. It's a reference that Shane won't understand, or Michael, or... Um, They do feature LARPing in Robot Chicken as well, though. Oh, they do. Mm -hmm. And what we do in the shadows. Oh. Oh, my God, that's right, because they're looking (laughs) for virgins, and they're like, yeah, Uh anyone that's LARPing are virgins, so we'll just bring them onto our house. 
<laughs> See, I uh, I wouldn't know about that. Uh, I don't watch television. I'm just a wizard. Mm. Check us out. As long yep. as you aren't a grand one. Uh, in my experience, <laughs> D&D groups do not LARP. And God LARPing damn, groups Michael. do... <laughs> what is happening today? I was on vacation. I come back. This is what I come back to. I would like to go back to my vacation now. Furthermore, I used to be a wizard, and now I'm a dragon. <laughs> That's better. It's a I good, a good upgrade. Motion. Oh, no. <laughs> That's why we're playing. <laughs> um, in my experience, D&D groups do not LARP, and LARPing groups do not play D&D. Um, but not mutually based, exclusive. Just, that seems you know, pretty close-minded, that's, it's just Michael. When, well, in my experience, usually like it'll be different groups. People can you know pick and choose depending on what they want. Um, it's not saying that one person can't do both. It's saying that typically a group is formed for either D&D or LARPing. Um, but based on my research, this wasn't the case for MSU students. This is where I mentioned that MSU has steam tunnels, uh, which for us Arizonans are large tunnels that connect the buildings of the campus to a large central heating plant. Uh, that way, the buildings are kept warm during the winter without having to heat all the buildings separately. Uh, these tunnels are fairly old, as the university itself is fairly old, according to the university website. Ah, and you got to watch the boiler, because she'll creep on you. She will. I, I actually titled this, uh, this section, Chasing Through the Tunnels with It, because what, during this whole story I was reading, I, I was immediately, I was completely, Completely thinking of it. I will say it every time. I think it's adorable that you have headers, and I think it's even more adorable that half the time we don't even know unless something <laughs> like this happens, and then you get excited and tell us the name. So, in the annals of our history, there are so many top like headers that we have not known about, and there's probably and some, there's probably some good ones in there too. There's probably some like oh, watch this fucking dumbass John not get this shit. <laughs> No, I don't think there's any or, spiteful ones. Or like a header that's like, I'm going to explain to John what a fucking picture book is. <laughs> We're not talking about my episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would be a fun Patreon concept, though, is have Michael just go back and specifically read his headers. I have been debating that. Oh, Because I sure. think that would be interesting. Monetize any way you can. Exactly. Gotta sell, get sell, that sell. money. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> right turn, Clyde. <laughs> By the 60s, students were entering these tunnels to do stuff. What this stuff was, uh, it was inventively called tunneling. Or According- psilocybin. No. This sounds very Mormon to me. It, it was <laughs> called tunneling. I actually had to look up, uh, I, I went on to MSU's official website, their actual at, like university website, to f- try and find more information about these steam tunnels. They didn't really say, or at least I couldn't find how old they were, other than the fact that they were old okay. just as the university was old um and it didn't explain what tunneling was well it just, you're it were to infer that it means it is the tunnel of love that's it's what i'm presuming love, love. um it was a common pastime for students doesn't say what it was but it was a common pastime or what they were um, passing or what was passing children. through them um <laughs> Face, neck, and chest. Um, <laughs> by James's time of 1979, campus security would frequently lock the entrances to the tunnels and patrol them. Uh, but that didn't stop the LARPing in those tunnels. Yeah, we don't even care to shake these zipper blues. Oh, no, I didn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> this was taking place in 1979, so it's very important mm. to note. Also, being alone in tunnels sounds just terrifying to me. That doesn't sound like a place where I would go have imaginary fun and like <laughs> decompress and distract my brain. This is what I do on Saturday nights to decompress and distract myself from reality. He just ends in a he ends up in a sewer and he's like, "This is nice." I'm haven't... dressed as a clown and chasing children. That's normally how I, you know, conduct so myself. So you were the inspiration behind it, not John Wayne Gracie. Well, uh, Gacy, it, whatever. Gracie, whatever. <laughs> Gacy. Whatever. Well, which, which came Tomato first, potato. the chicken or me? Well, Shane, Margot dressed us all like clowns. <laughs> Indeed. Um, have you guys seen the trailer for Alex Garland's new movie, Men? No. Yes. Oh. It so, is very unnerving. Yeah. Uh, one, I can't wait to see it, and I think I missed my opportunity to see it in theaters, but that's whatever. Um, in the trailer, like this gal is standing at the end of a you know a small tunnel, 
small ish, sm- big enough that the person at the end is a silhouette that she's seeing. Big and enough she, that you'll feel it once it's in there. And there, there's the sequence is just reaffirmed how much I hate tunnels and how scary they are for me. Anyway, okay, you're just triggering uh, me a lot. You gave a trigger warning, and I still was triggered. Uh, I feel like <laughs> well, I, I gave feel like a you different owe me trigger money. warning. So, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. There's I wish I, thought I knew it was the a exact term. Trigger. No, I said trigger for showering with the brave little toaster. Okay, so what we're saying is there's so many triggers, Roy Rogers doesn't know what to mount. This is actually (laughs) trigger part three. Okay, noted. um, James also LARPed in the tunnels. Uh, So when he went missing uh, on August 15th, 1979, it was immediately thought he just got lost in the tunnels when LARPing. Uh, One rumor, however, was that he went to the tunnels to go commit die as his character had recently perished in a campaign a week later is that a rule <laughs> no it's so like a it, that's down, why it was uh, very Japanese bizarre trait you know like <laughs> well you know when you die in the game you die in real life so i i have seen stay alive and i do appreciate it so frankie <laughs> muñoz and i would be long gone oh man uh, is that a lie michael no that that was a rumor that he just his character had died, and so he was like, and to be to be honest, that isn't the first or that isn't the last time we're going to hear about that as a cause. Um, a week later, so after a week of him being gone, uh, James's uncle hired a private investigator by the name of William Deere to find James. Uh, William Deere had plenty of leads given what he knew about James. These and he had leads, plenty of money because his brother John's been just you know tunneling stuff for years for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, these leads were focused around rumors, but if that's all you have to work with, then you start there. I'm not going to cover all the the theories and rumors that he explored. I'm just going to cover a couple of the main ones. Um, William considered a theory that James was kidnapped. Excuse me, that James was kidnapped by someone in the local gay community. But I'm not going to go into detail about that line of rumors, in part because I think it relies too much on the misinformation about gay culture in the 70s. Um, William Deere considered those theories, unfortunately. Um, But another private investigator from New York, a Don Gillitzer, uh, offered to help after hearing about the missing person's case. Given Gillitzer was gay himself, he had volunteered to ask around the local scene with the assumption that he had a better chance of figuring things out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it also didn't help that, in addition to James being a genius at computers, he was also very, very knowledgeable about chemistry, specifically drugs, and was actually making his own drugs while he was in college. Mm. Another theory William Deere considered was that James was kidnapped by drug dealers for his drug acumen. Was he actually making drugs? Yes. Um, I don't Walter recall White. exactly um, off the top of my head what drugs he was making, but it was something that he can. He wasn't like doing Breaking Bad or something like I was that. Say, in a, yeah, but well, it was the something. The theory is they're just going to take and Heisenberg him away in a little plant somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So or a more m- mobile meth lab just hanging out in the back of someone's trailer. Yeah, I, I, if I recall correctly, he was making pretty much party drugs or, or you know, those sort of like kind of drugs that people took in the 70s. Um, Both theories believe that James was kidnapped as a thorough search of the tunnels revealed evidence that James was actually down there at some point, but not anymore. Aside from a blanket and some food, the other evidence that they found encouraged both kidnapping theories as uh, they had found a mortar and pestle, which is used for grinding up herbs or other sort of things kind of to make drugs, uh, and, and an old and very used dildo, implying that it was brought along I'm sorry, bought long before James had gone to college, which would imply that it wasn't him. So you would then say probably a dildo. Yeah, like not yeah. his dildo. The indefinite. I, yes, I, huh? I guess, yes, yes, yeah. But it, it, it was there was a lot of emphasis on the fact that it was an old one, that it was something that he could not have possibly owned. Himself. Was it also crusty or just dusty? Because the answer is important. Well, it was in the tunnels for a long time, so the answer was yes. Well, furthermore, like why bring the... the- you know, mortar down there. You could have just, you know, ground things up with the dildo. 
Well, the idea Fair. was that he had brought his own stuff to make his own drugs while he was waiting there, and then he met up with someone else and at the, some point who brought said dildo. And the oh, dildo was important to the yes, creation yeah. of the drugs, because to Shane's mm-hmm. point, you do need something to kind of crush all that stuff up. So, And, and also, you want your own special sauce in there as well. It's your signature. I yeah, mean, I put chili is... paste in mine. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what you cut the drugs with. Is anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, since this was the '70s, young genius college students don't just disappear into thin air. Uh, the media caught on to this mystery, starting with MSU's local newspaper, and eventually coming becoming a nationwide story. I was going to say, no, college students disappeared a lot in the '70s, friend. This is when serial killer culture was really in full swing, like really popping so, off. Indeed. Just well, ask I mean, Ed Kemper. I mean, like, yeah, that's why I that's why the specifics like young genius college students. Like, yeah, there were oh. always college students that disappeared and Super. stuff like wow. that. But like, but you, I mean, because you always hear these stories about like local twelve year old goes to college and all these other things like that I've nowadays. I literally so, never heard one of those stories. Not once. <laughs> I have I have obsessed over a couple of those on air where I'm like, oh I, here I am on my eleventh year of college and this guy was born the year before I started and he's getting into college. So. Your yeah, obsession well, we with all... twelve year old collegiates is my fear of twelve year old prodigies in general. Yeah. We all have inferiority complexes on this call. I don't think that that <laughs> needs to be documented extensively. Well um, so <laughs> it just makes me want to tell go. Michael that I started taking college classes at 15 just to really hurt him. Well, I mean, <laughs> I kind of did two AP courses, etc. But I mean, like attending college. But anyway, what you think um, you're better than me? <laughs> no, that's that's the problem. Um, <laughs> however, uh, William Deere wanted to keep. Uh, his drug and sex theories out of the press, in part out of respect for James and his parents, but also because he didn't want anyone who might have kidnapped James to freak out that he was, you know, that they were, you know, closing on in. On their and, snail trail, as it were. And yes, and and kill him. Mm-hmm. Um, so William Deere pushed the D&D theory that he just got lost in the tunnels while LARPing. Or, you know, he pushed those sort of theories to the press. Okay. Now, before we delve deeper into the media circus that came about, I do want to finish James's story as it is a pretty sad one. Read the trigger warning that I said earlier. Mm-hmm. James later revealed, because he was eventually found by Deer, uh, that he tried to overdose on quaaludes in the tunnels. Mm-hmm. For those who don't know, quaaludes are a sedative that causes a relaxing, almost hypnotic high uh, prescribed for insomnia and as a muscle relaxant. And it also um, gives you one of the best scenes in a Martin Scorsese movie. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Shane knows. And if you know out there, you know. <laughs> if, if you know, know you know. Damn Indeed. it. <laughs> um, it was used in the club scene in the 70s. The plan was for James to find a cold, dark, hidden room in the tunnels and overdose. Um, thankfully, D&D reference, he rolled a, a one on his attempt and woke up sometime later from his overdose. Instead of heading home and stopping the nationwide search for him, he ran to the home of an older male admirer where he had hid for several weeks, which increased the hysteria over his appearance. When you get lost in a tunnel and everyone searches the tunnel you know, what happened to him. And that's a metaphor. Um, you see, stay in school. Don't do drugs. That's the metaphor. And don't LARP. <laughs> don't fucking LARP. <laughs> Just don't. Heaven help you. Don't LARP. Don't role play. Keep everything vanilla. Um, <laughs> Mr. Deer eventually found James, uh, who then, he then spent some time with James before trying to take him back to help him come to terms with his situation. Because at that time, that's, uh, that is when James came out to him. Um, and the main reason why James came out to Deer, in part because he was, you know, found at an older male admirer's house, um, was that Deer was the first person to really listen to James and actually give a fuck about what he had to say. Uh, like I said before, he was really pushed by his parents and his education, them having forced James into college when he was 16. A good example of how hard they pushed him came three days before his appearance or disappearance, not his appearance, his disappearance. Uh, he had told he had called his mother and told him that he had earned a 3.5 for his computer course, which 
I presume was at a 4.0, uh, to which his mother responded that he should have gotten a 4.0. So it's the never good enough idea, right? you know, get him in this college as soon as possible, etc. I would like uh, to ask for the record what his parents did for a living or what their list of uh, academic accomplishments were. I couldn't really find that. I also didn't dig too deep in his parents, uh, into looking up his parents. Um, Don't blame you. Because, yeah, I just, I didn't yeah. really want to, de- yeah. Um, I, yeah, deep dives on parents are often terrifying things. Exactly. I didn't want to try and find out, like, random things about them. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, James gave William Deer the slip and disappeared again, this time to... New Orleans. Terrible choice of words. Yeah. Yeah, I realize that. Uh, This time to Nolens, uh, Mm, where he got into the party scene there. Um, He attempted suicide again, this time with cyanide. Poor guy. But again, was unsuccessful. That Uh, can't have been fun. Yeah, um, overdosing on quaaludes and then cyanide and being unsuccessful both times. That, I mean, but yeah. also what cyanide does to you comparatively, like, I mean, is much worse. At that yeah. point, like, if that was me, I think I would just start accepting the fact that I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> I you want to just Buster Casey it? Yeah. I can't <laughs> start fucking letting die. snakes bite yeah. you? <laughs> yeah, I can't fucking die. Let's do this. Um, he then took a job as a laborer at a uh, oil field. At an oil field. Wow, what the fuck? Sorry. Did he also give them the slip? Or? No. He then took a job as a laborer at an oil field, and later, on August 17th, 1980, he attempted suicide yet again, this time with a gun, and succeeded. Aw, buddy. Yeah. I, Which I kind of understand if drugs aren't necessarily working more directly. Um, four Rough. years after... William Deere wrote a novel, The Dungeon Master, in part because he wanted to dispel the inf- the misinformation surrounding D&D as the major culprit behind James's disappearance. But he had waited those four years to publish because James had pleaded with William to not make his homosexuality public. But by then, it was too late. The media had run wild with D&D, driving a kid to suicide, and no book was going to change that. James wasn't the only suicide linked to D&D. Another teenager, Irving Pulling, committed suicide in 1982, and his cause of death was allegedly connected to the school-supervised D&D campaign. I mention Irving because his mother, Patricia Pulling, made headlines when she sued when she sued the school director and TSR, the then publisher of D&D materials, alleging that her son died because, quote, he had received a curse during the game session. The school supervised game session. We yes. will note. Because mm-hmm. they're prone to lighting candles and saying <laughs> incantations before doing anything. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. that's legal okay. now, so. Yeah, that I is mean, true. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. And other ridiculous nonsense is not, unfortunately. So here's for puritanical bullshit. <sighs> The court case lasted two years before it was eventually thrown out, Um, but um, and today, it is still the most expensive court case in California, having cost over $15 million over the course of the whole case. Damn. In addition to the court case, Patricia started the group BAD, spelled B-A-D-D. Oh, that's dang. Can you guess what it stood for? Bitches Against Drunk Driving. (laughs) That would be better. I think it was uh, bitches against doing dicks, I think is really what we're driving oh, at there. But. I like that one better. Uh, no, it was bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. No. Is it also Ooh. bullshit? It was true. It's, it's true. <laughs> bothered about Dungeons Patricia, and Dragons. Patricia, that was the best you could do. I've told, I, I know, right? I've oh, told the story about the uh, some of the awesome marketing for Dead Space 2. Did I ever tell you guys that story? I don't recall. No, there no. was a an awesome, and this kind of reminds me of it. Um, it was a marketing campaign where they showed mothers, or like they pulled 
older women off the street <laughs> to make them watch a trailer for like some gameplay for Dead Space program. too. Which if you've ever played Dead Space, like it's very visceral, gory, sci-fi horror. Um, and the reactions they were using, like the visceral, like this game is fucking evil to sell it to kids. So <laughs> <laughs> like That's your brilliant. mother hates Dead Space too. And you're like, well, fuck my mom. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a leap yeah okay don't mind if i did somewhere <laughs> freud is really excited <laughs> <Just> licking <laughs> his lips what was patricia bothered about dungeons and dragons you may ask well she was bothered about a game that she described as quote a fantasy role-playing game which uses demonology witchcraft voodoo murder Blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination, and other teachings. I mean, outside I mean, that- of the r- I think all the other stuff sounds just fine. I was, I was I going to say, you just <laughs> described the public school system in Arizona. I don't know what the expectation is for other conduct, but... Yeah, and, and that wasn't even talking about D&D. That was just a school-sponsored aspect. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Around this time that bad was, you know, in vogue, um, a book had came... Uh, came? A book had came. A book <clears throat> came out. A book came out, Mazes and Monsters. And a year later, in 1982, the book was turned into a film of the same name. Starring Tom Cruise as Robbie Wheeling, it focuses on a group of friends in college who play the fantasy role-playing game Mazes and Monsters. Each friend has their own problems and issues with their lives, driving home the point that only rejects and losers play these sorts of games. Robbie uh, was kicked out of his last school for being too obsessed with Mazes and Monsters. Not only that, he deals with an alcoholic mother an overly strict father, and a brother who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. One friend, part of the group, JJ, eventually feels cut out um, or left out, I don't know why I said cut out, left out by his friends, since Robbie and the token female of the group, because it has to have a token female, Mm. um, start a relationship. And so JJ decides to commit suicide in a local cavern. In the process of planning it out, and visiting the cavern, JJ realizes that the cavern would make for a bitchin' campaign location for their Mazes and Monsters game. And that is true. I I wish it was really easy to, you know, take someone out of that sort of spiral. You know, hey man, I know you feel like showering with the brave little toaster and all, but check out this cavern. It'll give you a reason to live. Like, that was probably, I mean, that's one of the more crazy parts about this movie. I know spelunking can cause an increasing degree of enthusiasm over time, but I mean that's a bit extreme. And Tom Cruise yeah. is in the movie? I was going to say, yeah, that's my Outside first Outside of the bullshit. movie, yeah, t- Tom Cruise being in the movie is bullshit. It, it's bullshit. That's far <laughs> yeah. too popular an actor to cast in something like this. Actually, it was Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks was the lead role. It was actually his first lead role. But I was going to say, yeah, considering Tom Hanks wasn't exactly an established <laughs> I name. I like how at Michael that point. is like yeah. wagging his fucking finger at Shane, being like, didn't ah. you know that it's actually his first role? <laughs> yeah. Well, because I thought it was so bizarre that, that something a movie like existed this... that you knew something about. <laughs> well, it originally, I was originally, instead of Tom Cruise, I was going to say, um, I was going to say someone else. Bruce Willis. He was on Voyage of the Mimi. <laughs> ben Bruce Affleck. Willis. <laughs> Bruce Willis. I was going to say Ben Affleck. Dude, Ben Affleck didn't but... start acting until the 90s. No, he actually was in a, a show in the 80s. And I only remember that because I watched said show. Said show. Shed I watched show? that show in but, school. I've... It was actually a PBS show called The Voyage of the Mimi. And it was like an archaeology based show. You have <laughs> such a beautiful mind. It. It was so fascinating to kind of like make that connection, but I knew that if I said that, it would be immediately called. Okay, but so if this is time, where your this is where your taste is, and you're hectoring <laughs> to me about lecturing you about pre-splash era Tom Hanks as not necessarily <laughs> being a notable star on a marquee. Voyage of the Mimi. Get the fuck out of here. I didn't say it was a popular role. That was just the role that I remember Ben Affleck. And my initial impulse was to think of... the world's a stage. Yes, yes. I was thinking about the Grecian philosopher Didymus and... 
<laughs> Damn near killed him. He smelled um, like Fremunda cheese in a septic tank. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, during a session in the cavern, Robbie, which was played by Tom Hanks, uh, has a psychotic episode and hallucinates the last time he saw his brother alive. And while still hallucinating, Robbie thinks he's slain a monster during this whole session. After doing so, he deludes himself into thinking he actually is his character from the game, the cleric Pardieu. Um, it, it's a French-looking name, so I'm probably butchering it. Just just for all the Mazes and Monsters fans out there. Mm-hmm. Don't chew me apart yeah, for it. Yeah, you can't be held responsible um, for the English language, let alone something else. Exactly. Wait. <laughs> he Wait. brokes up. He brokes up. He breaks up with What's the he, token. What's he, f- Yeah, he brokes up. <laughs> <laughs> he breaks up with the token female, Kate, for those that wanted to know her name. Uh, well, because as the as token a- female character, I would like to know her name. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, her she name has a name Kate. and she has rights. Thank you very fucking much. Actually, she doesn't have rights anymore, no rights, unfortunately. No. But, oh, uh, that's right. That's sad. So at I'm least give her a name. A- I Remember was going to the... say, I'm surprised she was even allowed to have one. Uh-huh. Um, We're going from suffrage to suffering. This is our transition, 2026. Ooh, Look forward connection. to it. Ugh. Um, so he breaks up with Kate because as a cleric, he must be celibate. <clears throat> the scene where he breaks up with her is actually one of the major influences on the incel movement. <laughs> no. In... <laughs> no it's Get the not. fuck out of here. <laughs> I originally had that as a comment that I, a sarcastic comic a comment I was gonna do, but I wanted to make it as a lie because it was just so funny. He's like, "Oh, I can't date because I need to be celibate. I'm a cleric." Um, if you no, wanted yeah. to have the actual like origin story of the incel movement, read the Art of the Deal. Ooh. <laughs> also, Ooh. the plot of this movie is still better than the last season of Game of Thrones. I mean. Yeah. I'm just going to patently disagree with that, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. I'll be the outlier here. It's all good. <laughs> um, so he breaks up with Kate and then starts drawing maps to a sacred place that he's called the Great Hall. Uh, in a dream, the Great Hall tells him he needs to go to the two towers because this movie is going to include Lord of the Rings as well because might as well include all the nerd shit you can. Robbie connects the two towers to the twin towers of the World Trade Center no. and runs off to New York City. Yes. <laughs> oh, my he God. He goes to New York City. And while embracing all that New York has to offer in the 80s, he stabs a mugger. Not because it's a mugger, but because he deludes himself into thinking the mugger is a monster. Don't you mean muggle? <laughs> no. <laughs> also, I think like this is where Stephen King got the Dark Tower Six. Yeah, so. Dude, right? <laughs> Gotta go back to the towers. Um, seeing blood on his knife because he brought a knife. He's a cleric. He should be armed like so. That's not um, a knife. <laughs> that's my wife. Anyway, <laughs> it was what? a good stab. I appreciate yeah, your attempt. Just, just like he stabbed the mugger. Yeah. Uh, Seeing the blood on his knife, his delusion breaks just long enough to call his friends and ask for help. His friends catch up with Robbie. I can't stop LARPing. Help. It's it's become Uh, a big problem. (laughs) His friends find him uh, at the top of the Twin Towers. He's about to jump off, thinking that he'll find the Great Hall if he casts a spell while falling. His friends stop him at the last moment. The film ends with his friends visiting Robbie, who is now living with his parents and gets regular counseling. But he still deluded himself into thinking he is his cleric. His friends, who feel partially responsible for his delusion, decide to engage him in a one last final game of mazes and monsters, letting Robbie dictate what's going on in his fantasy world. It ends with Kate narrating... And so we played the game again for one last time. And that's how the movie ends. The movie itself did not fare well with viewers. Today on IMDb, (laughs) it has a rating of 4.1 out of 10. And thankfully, the one blessing is that it did not destroy Tom Hanks' career in the process. Uh, Considering Wikipedia does not list audience reception to that movie, or even the budget, or even what it made in the box office... 
I think it's safe to say that it bombed. Michael, have you uh, actually seen this movie? I've watched the scene of them pulling him away from jumping off the uh, the Twin Towers. And it is... Beautiful? Funny. It's it's hilarious. It you there's a lot of overacting and it's great. Okay. I was gonna say um, if you're a cleric, you are. I imagine there's a certain affectation to the role. Yeah, because he's supposed to be sounding. I don't remember exactly what he was. I don't. I don't remember if he said anything in particular other okay. than just like sobbing and stuff Take like that. If your I recall. hands from me, friends. <laughs> um, but it is. Yeah. It, okay. From what I remember, it is. It is a funny scene and. It is available on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, though, it did contribute to the overall panic surrounding D&D since it helped spread that misconception that playing D&D will get you killed. Uh, with D&D getting media attention on the streets and in the sheets, I mean, in the courts and in Hollywood, uh, it made sense to address this whole D&D business on a, se- uh, on a segment of 60 Minutes. I know that it's bad when you, you're watching us waiting to be chastised for making a horrible, horrible sort of phrase. <laughs> I won't give it to you. Oh, deprive me. Daddy. Hosted by Ed Bradley, for all you Gen Xers and boomers, uh, who <laughs> he opened up the segment of this 60-minute um, show with a line that D&D, quote, has become popular with children everywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected with a number of suicides and murders, unquote. To show how balanced this segment was, the feature, the feature, the segment featured interviews with Gary Gygax, co-creator of D&D, Dr. Thomas Radecki, president of the National Coalition on TV Violence, and our friend P- Patricia Paul- Pulling. I keep wanting to say Pauling instead of Pulling. Patricia Pulling. That's such a hard name for some You're reason. You're pulling me apart. Founder. You're pulling my leg. Um, Patricia Pulling, founder of Bad. It also included extensive interviews with parents of players of the game whose subsequent murders slash suicides were connected to the game. In all, Dr. Radecki linked the game to 28 murders and suicides. Gary Gygax gave a response to this information, which I'll read now because it feels relevant to all the other X media or X this, X that causes violence pop culture stories. He said, this is make-believe. No one is martyred. There is no violence there. To use an analogy with another game, who learns how to fight from Mortal Kombat? Nobody learns to shoot lightning out of their hands or rip someone's heart out with their own bare hands. There is no link, except perhaps in the mind of those people who are looking desperately for any other cause than their own failures as a parent. Mic drop. Dang. Pretty much. It's, I love that. It was a great, I, that's why I had to include it, because the end part was just, mwah, it was beautiful. The next section, Jesus once said that LARPing is the only way into hell, look it up. We can't say that it was the uh, that it was only the media and their propensity to over sensationalize stories like James's. Right wing Christians were starting to become a serious problem, having organized around controversial events. Air quotes controversial, very niche <laughs> topics. I was like, like that they were starting to become a problem. Well, this was the rise of the the moral majority, and a lot. They I know. Started getting I'm just a lot saying, more, individuals yes. who endured the Crusades might have said that they were an issue for a minute. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Very fair point. <laughs> um, they became, they were becoming more organized around very controversial, kind of niche topics like public school desegregation and top, topically Roe v. Wade. Hmm. This was also about the same time as the rise of televangelists like Jerry Falwell, meaning everyone was hearing about the decline of America because of demons through Satanism or magical witches through Wicca. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so whenever gods and magic were involved as D features plenty of both it was a recipe for disaster i'm not going to cover this in detail as that would require its own episode and that's not something i would cover myself in part because out of all of us co-hosts here i've been the one least affected by religion i wrote that way <laughs> long ago and now it seems even worse nowadays yeah i still have to take a pill twice a week Oh, yeah. 
Suffice it to say, conservative and religious groups threw their lot in with the likes of Patricia Pulling and Bad. However, there is one facet that I do want to touch on, but since we live in an audio medium, I can't really show it. During this time, there was a rise in religious comics, and one author, Jack Chick, jumped on the D&D bandwagon by making one of the most well-known anti-D&D comics called Dark Dungeons. I just feel like if Jack Chick and Patricia Pulling ever met, we would have an orgy the likes of which had never been seen. But they don't do that because that's satanic. It's a fine point. I'm well, you got to put a bag over your head. you got to be married for 30 years, and it only has to be for children. Michael, 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 you're forgetting the importance of tunneling. You're right. When you tunnel, everything's okay. That's God's loophole. <laughs> the, never mind. No, the that's God's loophole. Butthole. Oh, no. Well, an entirely different interpretation of prairie dog in it. Oh, no. <laughs> In a nutshell, to describe <laughs> Dark Dungeons. <laughs> Appropriate pun, thank you. <laughs> it The comic covers a tip, or it starts. It covers it starts Patricia, with apparently. <laughs> face, neck, and chest with the prairie dog. And, uh, uh. It starts with a typical D&D dungeon crawl, like what normal D&D players do. Um, but then the party's thief fails to find a trap and dies as a result. The player is then immediately kicked out of the group, which I have to say is pretty fucking harsh, in my opinion. I've never been in a group that's like, oh, your character died. Get the fuck out. Hot take. I can't can't imagine anyone would want to be part of a group like that. As someone who's been in several D&D groups, uh, the worst that I have seen when a character dies is that we all went outside and lit their character sheet on fire, kind of like sending them to Valhalla or something. That's like the worst I've ever seen when a character dies. (laughs) Well, we're taking it to that next level next time. The next person who dies is off the podcast forever. (laughs) They're just kicked from the Either that or they just have to smash their phone. (laughs) Damn. Um, (laughs) Anyway, the main character of the comic, Debbie, is then pulled aside by her dungeon master, which is the name of the person that leads D&D groups. Indeed. Um, And Debbie is told that she is ready to learn spells in real life. Her cleric is able to learn level eight spells, which means that she is able to learn real spells. Was this Scientology? Uh, Yes. She (laughs) she leveled up enough where she can finally learn about Lord Zenu. And she does all this with the help of her dungeon daddy? Dungeon master. Sorry. Thank you. Her DM uh, invites her to the witch's coven, where Debbie, called Elfstar, because that is the name of her cleric in the game, um, becomes a priestess of the temple of Dana. Dana? Or Diana. Dana. I can't, I can't read. <laughs> Diana. There is no Dana. <laughs> There's only Diana. Uh, at home, Debbie uses her, quote, mind bondage spell. <laughs> That's what it said. Okay, when your DM wants to DP. She uses her mind bondage spell, not on her DM, but on her father, for no other reason than he tried to make her stop playing D&D. Daddy bondage? Oh, no. Daddy mind bondage. Okay. Uh, Daddy she no forced like. Her... <laughs> no, no, no. With that spell, Daddy like. Technically. <laughs> Daddy like. <laughs> Uh, she then forced her father to spend $200 on new D&D figurines oh, and manuals. That's rookie numbers, man. Exactly, considering that she didn't buy any dice at all. So I would kind of say the spell failed. <laughs> uh, the person whose thief had died, Marcy, tries to call Debbie and ask for help. Who ignores her? In the comic, she's actually playing D&D by herself at her... DM's house and fighting a zombie. One lonely so, roll. The the DM answers the phone and she's like, "Hey, Debbie, Marcy wants to talk to you." And she says, "I can't. I'm too busy fighting a zombie." Straight from the pages. Okay. Fuck <laughs> off. I'm busy. Exactly. Um. My dad didn't take the spell as well. <laughs> I need to level up more. Uh... Um. <laughs> Debbie then later on decides to stop by Marcy's house to see what, you know, what, what's up. And she finds <gasps> Marcy took a shower with a brave little toaster, like 
actually dropped the toaster into a bathtub. In her note, Marcy wrote that the, since her thief was electrocuted by that trap, she should go out the same way. Later on... I do Debbie, love that this is your euphemism that you're electing to just ride or die with, pun intended. Uh, so, bless you for that. I mean, I'd get the matching uh, tattoo with you. Also, I kind of felt like... Yes? The brave little toaster would never. The depraved little toaster, on the other hand... No, the he'd grave... Be you are The grave right. little toaster. The <laughs> depraved little toaster, you're so right. Or the grave little toaster, yes. either way. The grave would... one, too. Oh, damn it. Welp. <sighs> yep. I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave now. Um, Even your head cannon's fucked. <laughs> I can't keep it there. Later, Debbie's DM tells her to get over Marcy. Um, Don't be a Debbie Downer. Ex- <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, that it was going to happen eventually, anyway. Um, as Marcy's spirit was just too weak, Debbie doesn't understand since her priestess elf star's faith prevents her from harming anyone debbie then immediately finds a pastor because that's when you are like i just let someone die in real life but my my elf priestess wouldn't do that i need to talk to a pastor pastor um damn near killed her no damn did kill her um I take debbie then back. finds that pastor who tells her to come to a sermon and in that one sermon Debbie sees the error of her ways and, in the end, burns all of her D&D material. Go you. Go you, Debbie. Yeah. At what cost? The, uh, $200. At least $200. <laughs> mm-hmm. But hey, she still has that mind bondage spell. Um, the comic yeah, then ends... Yeah, that's called Christianity. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. Um, the... <laughs> The comic then ends with a questionnaire. It asks only two questions. <laughs> yes, no question. Sorry, I misread that. Would you like to buy my duck? Yes, yes, it asks, yes. Can you make it mayonnaise asks, with hands only? What is your favorite color? With that attitude. Um, <laughs> what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? The uh, first question. What do lobster farts smell like? <laughs> <laughs> the first question... Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for you? No. And then, did you ask him to come into your heart to save you? I asked him to if come into my If you answered face. yes to both... Sorry, John, go for it. <laughs> Sorry, I think Shane already heard it. I said no, but I did ask him to come on my face. Well, if it was on the chest, it would have been close enough. If you answered yes to both, then the comic... Yes, it's supposed to be a comic. Then ask you to sign and date the back page... So you can remember when God saved that your soul. That is such Christian fucking bullshit, and I don't want to... Bu- is that bullshit? It's not bullshit. It is true. It is true. It I is know true. it's true because I know how angry it makes me. I'm just back here thinking that uh, you know the individuals of this particular facet of faith must be really big fans of Trent Reznor, because if Christ can come in your heart, you can truly feel him from the inside. Ooh, you can, in fact, be closer to God. Indeed. Yeah. I'm telling you, I, th- this is apparently the, the Reznor version of, of Christianity. So, with all the death, court cases, Daddy and the bondage. media, <laughs> the mind bondage spell that the game had gotten, what do you think happened to the sales of the game? Skyrocket. It went up. <laughs> exactly. Um, everyone started buying the game. It, it was pretty much the Streisand effect before the Streisand effect was named. Um, For those unaware, the Streisand effect is a phenomenon wherein more attention is brought to a topic being purposefully repressed. Don't tell me not to live, just sit and putter. Life's candy and the sun's a bowl of butter. Don't bring around a cloud to rain on my parade. And that is what's going on in Shane's head probably like 90% of the day. That's what keeps him from devolving into a murderous rage and casting the mind bondage spell on a people. A song a day keeps the grave toaster at bay. A star is born. <laughs> a star is born. Um, <laughs> Why? Just. I'm I don't know. That was the first thing that popped into my head was Hercules. Okay, I'm sorry. A star has been aborted, and we've all supported it. <sighs> so for those who aren't aware of the Streisand effect... 
Uh, she sued to get a photograph of her residence removed from a website uh, and subsequently brought the number of times her photo, the photo of her residence was downloaded from six before the suing uh, to over 420,000 times in that following month. You could also call this the Pam and Tommy effect. Yes. I didn't get the reference, but you know what? Yes. You got the point. Yes. You did get yes. the point. Sales for D- D&D didn't prove that drastically from six to 420,000, but they essentially quadrupled, going from $2.3 million in sales in 1979 to 8.7 the next year. I want my dad to buy me big books. How do I do this shit? You got to learn the mind bondage spell. Indeed. Um, during, uh, However, not all was sunshine and rainbows for <laughs> D&D fans. During this panic, TSR, the publisher at the time, removed all references of demons, devils, and other potentially controversial supernatural monsters from the second edition of AD&D. So all the good which, stuff. Exactly. It was renamed... Um, Bland d and <laughs> <laughs> uh, It was, which was published in 1989. Devils and demons were renamed... I'm going to try my best to pronounce oh, this. No. Baetsetsu and Tenari respectively. And while they were still referred to as fiends in the text, their original names weren't uttered for years. In the late 90s, both terms were returned to the text. The president of Wizards of the Coast, which had recently purchased TSR, uh, had said, quote, their removal had just been lip service to the people who complained. That if they had picked up a monster manual and saw, uh, saw a gargoyle, they'd still think the game had demons. The New York Times finally declared in 1996 that the moral panic over D&D had subsided as, quote, parental anxieties have turned to videos, notably those dripping with gore. I like that there are people actually making these statements as well. Like, by the way, this panic is done. We've moved on to yet another one. Mark Mm -hmm. the high tide and keep your kids at bay. Put that in the history books. Um, Don't go into the water. People were concerned about video games. Mm-hmm. Oh, were they? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was the 90s. And that is my episode on the D&D Panic. How fabulous. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one question. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So, uh, when was the 2020 expose? That that they had the uh, the inventor on and all the individuals on for the the panel to discuss D and D because he referenced Mortal Kombat in the speech that you were so fond of, and I feel like <laughs> oh. that would have uh, you know predated the release of Mortal Kombat. And you're right. Okay, Woo-hoo! that was that was bullshit. All right, because um, he's like we just crested into the '90s on your timeline. I was like, yeah, that wouldn't have been any reference that anyone made at that point. Yeah, so the part of his speech that I made up was, who learns how to fight from Mortal Kombat? Nobody learns to shoot lightning out of their hands. Okay. Um, he actually said, who is bankrupted by a game of Monopoly? Nobody is. The money isn't real. I disagree. <laughs> My brother and I almost got into a fist fight over Monopoly. <laughs> But you weren't bankrupted. I morally. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's well, when my defined. grandmother called me potty mouth Shane in front of the whole family. Well, what did I was you say in, my in front 20s. of the whole what did you say in front of the whole family, Shane? Well, I called him a fucking liar is what I did. <laughs> oh, you called him a cocksucker. Ooh. He was right? he was stealing money out of the bank in front of everybody, and I saw him and I caught him doing it, and so I looked at and him square just... in the eyes and I said, Listen here, you fucking cocksucker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> language. <laughs> My goodness, you probably gave her a case of the vapors. <sighs> Any other <laughs> stabs at lies? Let um, me put it at what, you, three? Who did you say the host of 2020 was at the time? Bradley? No, it was it was 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes, okay, I'm yes, sorry. Yeah, I missed yeah it was a segment of 60 Minutes. All right. Yeah, sorry, that was my bad. But yeah, it was 60 no, Minutes. No, no, you it said was, 60 uh, Minutes, I just misheard you. So okay. it's not it, your it's bad. Fair. It's my I'm own unintelligible, bad. so it's it's okay. No, this is the lot that's <laughs> swimming through. And again, as I said, we're trying to make jokes. You're trying to think about jokes and somehow retain whatever linear narrative we're following here. So I feel it. Right. Yeah, no, it was Ed Bradley. Ed Bradley. Okay. Yes, yeah. This for is, sixty minutes. I'm over here thinking mm-hmm. about Hugh Downs and Barbara Wawa. So <laughs> Ah. Fair enough. 
any other stats. Uh, you mentioned that James had done computer work for the military. Was that true? Yes, okay. it was. He was At fixing 12? computers for the... Yes. Wow. That's, one article mentions that, and I, I thought it was so bizarre that I had to, I had to keep it in. Uh, was so. there actually a mortar and pestle in the tunnels along with the dildo? No, there was not. Okay. Um, wow. The dildo and the mortar and pestle were all lies. Okay. Uh, honestly, the, the stuff that they found was a blanket, a carton of sour milk, and some cheese and crackers. So I'm oh, still labor. living there. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, if you were, well, because he was just planning on going there to overdose on quaaludes and just, right? So why would he bring a mortar and pestle? Why would he meet up with someone with a, you know, an old used dildo? Like, <laughs> Furthermore, like, that's a really dangerous dildo insemination point. Uh, you know, if you're in a dark tunnel just trying to find a hole, someone's getting hurt. Yeah, you fall down wrong yeah. and it's game over. You indeed. You won't be able to get up. You will not. You dill do. You dill die. <laughs> <laughs> you would better dill don't. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned that both of the theories were kidnapping. Was that true, or was one at least a runaway theory? Because I feel like at that time period, every kid was a runaway. No. Um. I. I'm not sure what exactly caused him to think it was kidnappings but those were one of his both of those were main like major theories of his are you basing both i'm sorry michael no no you're good uh are you basing this opinion on uh, the bon jovi song of the same name there courtney <laughs> how did you know she's a little runaway yeah it's, okay <laughs> she's a little runaway oh there he goes <laughs> Got it. See, Got him. I get, oh, I get some no. references. Yeah, when there's the stars have aligned you. planets. Um, any others? I think that's all that I I retained. That was okay. really strong swings too. Mm. Though, I mean, you hit a couple. So, all right, first lie: the mortar pestle and the dildo. <laughs> um, the second one: <laughs> the dildo's never a lie. You're just not using it right. <laughs> That's true. Belongs Not with that attitude Indeed. is, is, is Not the, in this the slogan you got to use. <laughs> exactly. Um, the next lie, I said that they usually don't disappear, and I said that the media caught on to this mis- uh, misery. Mm-hmm. Mystery. It caught on to the mystery. So it actually wasn't the media that caught on and heard about the disappearance and spread it nationwide. It was actually William Deere. He wanted to utilize the media to try and get more of a canvas out to search for him. Okay. Uh, and so he went to the press instead of the press coming to him. I now have a delightful rendition of Angela Lansbury performing Mystery Business, as previously made famous by Paramore. <laughs> but go on. This is the Murder, She Wrote edition. <laughs> go on. Oh, I never I, meant I, to I, brag. I'm just saying. <laughs> I've got him where I wanted now. Um, the next lie, I said that the court case of Patricia Poling versus the school director in TSR was the most expensive court case in California. Okay. That was a lie because it was actually the McMartin preschool trial, which I had covered in the Satanic mm. Panic. So um, it, it did cost $15 million. I had to double check that. Okay. You caught Tom Cruise. Um, if only. You caught the incel movement. <laughs> Uh, you caught Mortal Kombat. Um, uh, you guys were sniffing around, and I kind of hinted at it, but no, Marcy did not take a shower with the grave little toaster. Um, it the the comics creator is not that creative or edgy. Yeah. Um, no, she she just hung herself. Oh well. Oh, that's just yeah. oh, that's just lay it out she, there like nicer. that. They, they, yeah, yeah. Well, and and they show the they show the whole feet dangling and and Debbie going ah you know that sort of thing. And you want to so. you want to talk about creativity? So I started. Uh, I I feel remiss in saying this, but as I've said, I don't like adaptations. I started to attempt to watch Castle Rock last night. Oh, oh, and okay. In episode one of season one, the gentleman who and I don't know his name unfortunately, but the uh, actor who essayed the role of uh, Locke in. Lost oh, okay. uh-huh. is in there, and in the opening mm-hmm. sequence here, he commits suicide by 
putting a noose around his neck while in an automobile and drives off of a cliff while the noose is tied to a tree. Oh, no. And I'm like, this it's... is ghoulish overkill here. I think you would have been sufficient doing either either or. Like, uh, I don't think you needed to go to the oh. nines there. Can't be too safe. Yeah. Yeah, it was... I remember that scene, yeah. and it was it was a bit much. Needless to I was say, like, oh, uh, okay. five minutes later, I had turned the thing off. I was like, I'm I'm oh. gonna give myself a little time to warm up to this. So okay, I was excited to see Alan Pangborn. I really was, but then they they disabused me of the notion that good things were gonna happen with this show. I will say Skarsgård from It. Yes, is, I saw is, that is he, he... They they have an interesting cast. It, it looks like a, a fun show. I just I feel like I need to be in the right headspace, and that was that's, not that's it. That's fair. I will say that that doesn't really occur. I mean, they I might reference back it's to a it, bit, but it's... Yeah, because he sees yeah. the dog and all the other nonsense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, it was a very odd way to start the show. No question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I guess if you want to reinvent the wheel, go ahead. But I feel like hanging works just fine on its own. Yikes. <laughs> you have to the wheel. treat it like you're pulling a tooth out of your head with the, you know, floss or something. No, uh, instead of just slamming the door shut with the string tied around his, uh, he decided to drive the car off with the with the tooth attached. Indeed, so. yes. Um, have a kid ride by on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, the last lie, I said the New York Times declared in 1996 that the moral panic over D&D had ended. Um, they actually declared that in 2016. Wow. And not during the moral combat debacle. Jeez. That was also a very weird thing that it's like, hey, guys, just in case you weren't aware, the panic is over. Also, I just don't know how we started announcing these cultural touchstones like that, where it's like, by the way, our infatuation with deep dish pizza is officially over. We've moved yeah. on to Detroit style. Exactly. Ew. I was so it was so biz like <laughs> in my research when I came across that, I was like, that's so weird because they wrote a whole piece like. Not commemorating, because that uh, that's a weird word to use. I don't know why I said uh -huh. that. But yeah, like announcing kind of revisiting. It, yeah. yeah, revisiting the whole panic and saying that, hey, it ended. So I just that was so bizarre to me. Like By the way, I we're mean, not racist anymore. Exactly. Like uh. news flash. The Confederacy ended. Intolerance has officially died a grisly death this very day on June 29th, two thousand eighty seven. Yeah. <laughs> we have eradicated exactly. it over the course of many, many years. <sighs> so, yeah, those were my lies, and that was my episode. Well done. Do you feel more learned about the 80s and the fun that happened in oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was really happy to do this episode, especially because I am re-watching Stranger Things mm -hmm. getting into season four, so... It was it was fun to touch back touch base on it and remember everything that I wrote about almost two or one and a half years ago. Now that I mentioned Indeed. time does fly. Mm -hmm. I, I feel mentally bondaged. <laughs> that wasn't my spell, I promise. We know. I don't know that spell yet. John, you keep doing that, and I keep thinking like the mall rats scene That's exactly of Silent what Bob I'm trying, trying to, to make do. the cigarette move. So yeah, stop, stop it, fat ass. Stop. <laughs> Not <that> you fat <laughs> fuck. <laughs> force is strong with this one. Uh, well, the, I'll tell you who the force isn't strong with. Uh, actually, I won't. No. That would be the <laughs> story. Legal says you can't Indeed. say that. Anymore. No, we're at the we're at the end of this episode. We're we're thinking about good and positive things right now. But yeah. uh, one, welcome back, John. I, we should have done it at the tippity top, but uh, good to see you. <laughs> I did. Glad you survived. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. And you, you didn't <laughs> roll them sausages. No, no, I did not. No. Not today. Indeed. No, good Lord. Yeah. Not with that attitude. Rocked me with a bratwurst. Uh, oh. But uh, it, it's always a delightful time here for us, and uh, thank you, Michael. But if you have also had a delightful time, listeners, you know you can tell us how. Uh, you can give us a little rate and review, you know, subscribe on any of your preferred platforms, be that YouTube, be it TikTok, wherever your preferred podcasts flee from, you know, go do those things. Give us a little love. Uh, we always appreciate hearing your feedback, even when it's people talking about our hot takes on panda sex. 
Which is some of the stranger comments I've ever seen, but yeah. I oh, weird, I missed that. Yeah, I yeah there's weird oh, there's, stuff there's, happening that's, on YouTube that's these probably, days. Now we're uh, getting, air quotes, popular. We're, we're getting people actually leaving comments, and it's, oh my it's God. interesting. That's probably a good story to leave us on, Shane. Would you please tell me some of these comments or just a quick recap of the, the oddity? Uh, I feel like I would have to pull it up. But uh, so, you know, as Michael is taking these conversations out of context... There's the discussion about which is the weaker species, be that pandas or humans, as pandas require such incredible incentivization to, uh, you know, procreate. And uh, one of the comments is like, who's she even talking about? Because Viagra only works on humans. Like, pandas can't actually take Viagra. And I'm like... (laughs) I mean, they can oh, take medicine. Oh, my sweet, sweet summer medicine. child. <laughs> <laughs> Completely missed the point by a mile. I'm glad yeah. our content is reaching who's it's intended for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, check your chin, friends. Your your mouth is agape. And also check uh, your sources. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cite, yeah. cite your sources. Prove to me pandas don't take Viagra. Uh, yeah, you want to leave little, it in a comment, Liberal please. fucking cuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Republicans okay. were built on Viagra. They're shoving it down the throats of anyone they can. <laughs> They're harder than <laughs> Chinese democracy. Uh, <laughs> Big Viagra is coming after you next. Yes, indeed. When one gun won't fire, we got to go buy some of the other type. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hot takes and uh, hot cakes <laughs> are all being dished out here at the Disinformed Podcast. But I think that is officially going to wrap this up like a body bag for this week. So, uh, again, please uh, check us out. New episodes fleeing every marvelous Monday morning. Uh, link in the show notes down there. We'll take you to all of our relevant socials, and you can engage with us in whatever way you see fit, and we will not be derisive. We appreciate all of your comments and your love. I won't block you on Facebook or, you know, remove things. It's, I, I promise we're going to treat you well. And so... For this particular installment of the Disinformed Podcast, I want to express, because I've been remiss in my duties, that I hope something great happens to you today. And I am shamed. I don't wish that for you, and my name is John. You're a miserable bastard. We've known this. (laughs) I hope something neutral to keep everything balanced happens to you. I hope just something. Be it good, bad... Shut the Michael. fuck up, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the token female, Courtney. Indeed. <laughs> and uh, no, I hope something great happens to you because nothing great fucking happens to me. Listen to this show. I'm giving you proof. <laughs> and with that, zippity zoop, we're out of here. I'm try to find a vape that I can... Never mind. <laughs> I, I botched it. I was going to read this fire thing for you. It's uh, everyone at the Jewel headquarters is scrambling to figure out how to make a gun you can vape. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> it'll happen. And it'll have more rights than me. Oh. God damn. I guess we're done. <laughs>